This is section 5.2, definite integrals. Uh, we have Riemann sums. In the preceding section, we estimated distances, area, and volume with finite sums. The terms in the sums are obtained by multiplying selected function values from the lengths of intervals. In this section, we move beyond finite sums to see what happens in the limit as the terms become infinitely small and their number infinitely large. And uh, we start out with sigma notation. That enables us to express a large sum in compact form. Now, if we have uh, an area, whether it's below the x-axis or above the x-axis, we can break that this up into actually very uh, random rectangles. They don't have to be uniform size like we saw before. And this says that we sum up k equals 1 to n, and that is the number of uh, rectangles we have. And a sub k, the area of each rectangle, equals area 1 plus area 2 plus area 3 plus area 4 all the way up to the nth rectangle. Just as LRAM, MRAM, and RAM in our early examples converged to a common value in the limit, remember when we did 100 intervals and then we did 500 intervals, it was converging to a value. Uh, to a common value in the limit, all Riemann sums for a given function on A to B converge to a common value as long as the lengths of the subintervals all tend to zero. So as long as you're making more and more rectangles and all of them are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, that's what this is. The subintervals tend to zero. The latter condition is assured by requiring the longest subinterval length, called the norm of the partition, and denoted by this uh, tend to zero as well. We have a definition, the definite integral as a limit of Riemann sums. Let f be a function defined on a closed interval a to b. For any partition p of a to b, let the number c sub k be chosen arbitrarily in the subinterval x, sub uh, x sub k minus 1 to x sub k. If there exists a number i such that the limit as the biggest uh, partition, the biggest rectangle, the biggest width is going to 0, uh, then the sum of all of the rectangles, this would be the height, if we go back here, all these C sub values are the height of the rectangles. This is the height times the width, the change in x. So from one x value, where to go? I hit the wrong one. From one x value to another is the change in the x values. So really, this is just base times height equals the area of all of them, because we're summing all of them up. No matter how p and c sub k's are chosen, then f is integrable, integrable on a to b, and i is the definite integral of f over a to b. So to find the area under the curve, we do what's called definite integral. Theorem 1 says the existence of definite integrals. All continuous functions are integrable. All continuous functions have, uh, you, you can integrate them. That is, if a function f is continuous on an interval a to b, then its definite integral over a to b exists. The definite integral of a continuous function on a to b. It's the limit as n approaches infinity, so the number of rectangles. The definite integral of a continuous function on a to b. Let f be a continuous on a to b, and let a to b be a partition into n subintervals of equal length. Then the definite integral of f over a to b is given by the limit as n approaches infinity, or in other words, the number of rectangles is approaching infinity, and then we have the base times the function value, or the height. This is still base times height of the rectangles, where each c sub k is chosen arbitrarily in the kth subinterval. In this definite integral notation, the Greek letters again become Roman letters in the limit. So look, this right here, this is uh, the Greek way to do this. We have the limit as n approaches infinity from k equals 1 to n. And all of that, that's really summation, summing up an infinite amount of rectangles. Well, that turns into the elongated s that the Romans used. So here's an s, and if you stretch it out, it looks something like that. So this is actually the integral sign from a to b of f of x dx. So if we wanted to find the area under the curve of x squared, from 0 to, let's say, 3, it'd be the integral from 0 to 3 of x squared dx. That is the difference. That's the change in x. And here's the function value right there. 
area under curve as a definite integral. If y equals f of x is non-negative, an integral over a closed interval a to b, then the area under the curve, we're talking about area under the curve, is y equals f of x from a to b is the integral of f from a to b. So here's the integral of f of x from a to b. The symbol is read as the integral from a to b of f of x dx, or sometimes as the integral from a to b of f of f of <laughs> the integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x. The component parts also have names. So this value up here is the upper limit. The specific example we have would be the 3. The lower limit would be 8a. In this case, it was 0. The function is the integrand. That's the integrand. And x is the variable of integration. All of this is the integral of f from a to b. When you find the value of the integral, you have evaluated the integral. So when we end up uh, working this problem, it's going to equal one value. Example 1, using the notation. The interval negative 1 to 3 is partitioned into n subintervals of equal length, change in x equals 4 over n. Let m sub k denote the midpoint of the kth subinterval, express the limit, all of that, as an integral. So all of this right here becomes the elongated s. And we're going from negative 1 to 3. So we have negative 1 to 3. And m sub k is uh, the x value that we're plugging into the function. So the function is 3x squared minus 2x plus 5, and delta x becomes dx. Example 2, revisiting area under a curve. Evaluate this right here. So we're going to evaluate the area under this curve from negative 2 to 2. Well, this is a circle. As a matter of fact, it's a half circle because we have y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. Well, if we square both sides, we have x squared plus y squared equals 4. So the radius is 2. And here's a uh, graph of the function. So we're really finding this area right under here. Well, this is a known object. We, we know the area of a circle. The area equals, since it's a half a circle, 1 half pi r squared. And the radius in this case is 2. So we have 1 half pi times 2 squared. Well, that equals, let's see, that's 1 half pi times 4, so the area is 2 pi of this half circle. Now, when you see integral, that means area under the curve, and this is, in, this is the area, so this would be units squared. Area equals negative from a to b f of x dx when f of x is less than or equal to 0. What this says is if we take that exact same problem, uh, it's a half a circle, and instead of being above the x-axis, it's below the x-axis, then the area of this half circle is considered to be negative 2 pi. Below the x-axis, negative area. Above the x-axis, we have it's considered to be positive area. Constant functions. Integral of constant functions are easy to evaluate. Over a closed interval, they are simply the constant times the length of the interval. Now, what this is saying is if you have the integral from, let's say, 1 to 3 of a constant, let's say 5 dx, well, that's this 5 uh, times the difference between these two numbers. So it's 5 times 3 minus 1, and this would be 5 times 2, which is 10. So in the train problem that we looked at yesterday, uh, a train moves along a track at a steady 75 miles per hour. So we saw that as a line, and it's from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, and we constructed a rectangle. So here's the area, which represents the distance the train has traveled. Express its total distance traveled as an integral this time. Evaluate the integral using theorem 2, so using what we just talked about. So the integral is the integral from 7 to 9 of the function y equals 75, so just 75 and then it would be dx. Actually, I think this was actually in time, so it would be dt. Well, to evaluate a constant function, doing the integral of the constant function, you just take 75 times 9 minus 7. And that's 75 times 2, and we again end up with 150 miles. 
We can use NINT on our calculator, evaluate the following integrals numerically. So here we have our graphing calculator, and we're going to evaluate x sine of x from negative 1 to 2. If you go into math and you scroll down to uh, number 9, here's the integral of the function. And we enter x sine of x. Then we tell it that we're integrating over x, and then from negative 1 to 2. Press enter, and we have 2.043. 2.043. In the next one, I can press, let's see, second entry. I can re-enter it, and I want to get rid of this function. And I can insert 4 divided by 1 plus x squared. Comma x, comma, now it's from 0 to 1. I need an insert, a comma, and then 0 to 1. Probably would have been quicker just to re-enter everything. Uh, this answer is 3.14. 3.146. So it ends up being uh, equal to pi, it looks like. And on the last one, I'll just go to math. I believe this is number 9. Yep. And I'm evaluating, I'm integrating e to the negative x squared. It's still the variable x. And we're evaluating from 0 to 5. And we get a value of 0.886. Here's what our homework's going to look like. In exercise 1 through 6, each c sub k is chosen from the kth subinterval of a regular petition of the indicated interval on n subintervals of length uh, delta x. Express the limit as a definite integral. Well, all of this right here becomes the integral sign. And this is uh, x squared minus 3x. And this is the change in x, dx. And what I didn't copy was the interval. Let's say it's from 1 to 4. I don't know if that's what it is for number 2 in the book. You can look. But the 1 to 4 would go right here. Now on this one, this becomes the, sum, uh, the elongated s. We're going from 2 to 3, and we're integrating 1 over 1 minus x. And this delta x becomes dx. So this is Greek, this is Roman. This is Greek, this is Roman. And we use the Roman uh, symbols almost exclusively. Evaluate the integral. Well, this is a constant, so we have negative 20 times 7 minus 3. So negative 20 times 4, negative 80. This is also a constant over here, pi over 2. So we have pi over 2 times negative 1 minus negative 4. It's always subtraction. So we have pi over 2 times 3. So it ends up being just whatever 3 pi over 2 is. In exercise 13 through 22, use the graph of the integrand in areas to evaluate the integral. Well, in this one, we're going from 1 half to 3 halves, and this is a line. And the line has a y-intercept of 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, a slope of negative 2. So down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1, and down, let's see, that would go from 4, I need to go down 2. I guess it's over here. Down 2 and over 1, down 2 and over 1. So there's the line right there. So I need the area of this triangle from 1 half to 1 and a half. I guess this is not a triangle. This is actually a trapezoid. So the area of a trapezoid equals 1 half base 1 plus base 2 times the height. Well, I do know what the height is. The height is actually sitting right here, and that's times 1. Uh, base 1 could be this value right here, and it's, wh it's what I get when I plug a half in. Well, if you plug a half in, you get negative 1 plus 4, so that's going to be 3. That actually has a height of 3. And 
the one and a half or the three halves, if I plug three halves into this, the twos cancel out, I have uh, negative three plus four, and that's actually a value of one. So the area of this object, the area under the curve, is uh, half of four, which is two. So I've evaluated this integral by evaluating a known area, a trapezoid. This one, we're going from zero to negative four. This is also a half a circle above the x-axis. So it ends not a half, well, this is a half circle, but we're only going from negative four to zero. So it's a quarter of a circle. So the area of this one is one-fourth pi r squared, but the radius is four. So we have one-fourth pi times 16, so this is 4 pi units squared, and this one is units squared as well.